I became paralysed in April 2013. It was a sudden thing. I woke up and couldn't feel my legs. So they did a lot of scans, um, MRI scans, and then they then came back and said that, you know, you got a brain tumour as well as a, a neurological condition. It was a dark time, like really dark, and I still have depression now. Why me? Why has that happened to me? Why is my health is getting as worse as it is? You know, having a brain tumour is one thing, but then having seizures and going in a coma and dying, being brought back to life because your heart stopped and after a massive seizure, you just think, well, I think I've suffered enough, you know? So how I get through my mental health is offering help for other people. This is called a rewalk exoskeleton suit and it's um, the only um, suit in the world that can climb stairs. So it can go up and down stairs, uh, which is insane. Uh, thinking you're paralysed and not you're just walking, but you can climb stairs as well. And it's all controlled via the watch. So it would mimic how you would walk. So to activate the suit, it would lean to the left and that would then activate the right foot. So then obviously when the right foot then lift up and put down, you then lean on the right hip it would then lift your left foot and then so on. This feeling of transferring from the, the wheelchair, um, from you know being two foot tall, to then transferring into here with a click of a button, I'm standing up and I'm six foot again. And I'm just having, just w walking off and uh, it's incredible. So I came, brought it to my house, tried it on, walked out my garden for the first time, you know, and walked on grass for the first time in four years in my own garden, which, you know, seems so, such a small thing, but it was amazing. I was like, oh, I'm walking on grass, you know, it's great. And um, and then seven months after that, I walked over the finish line at a marathon. I wanted to do the challenge because I wanted to prove that there's no such thing as can't. So I was with some friends, just having a meal in the pub, and I said, I want to do a marathon. So they went, OK, yeah, wheelchair racing. And you know, I said, no, I want to try and get hold of the exoskeleton suit. So we were originally told that, obviously, because of how long it was going to take me to walk to the first mile, that potentially we were going to be right at the back. And as we were approaching the first mile, we were just emotional wreck and I was trying not, you know, I was crying but I couldn't wipe my face because obviously I had the crutches because we then blended in to the other races and I was taking over some of the races to where we thought we were going to be on our own for ages and it just went from there because like people were like driving past us, parking their car at the side of the road just to get out to speak to me. At one point we had nearly 30 people walking the mile with us just because they wanted to join us because they'd lost a relation with a brain tumour, brain cancer and that kind of thing. And so complete strangers all coming together and just walking. It was just lovely. I had like my own army like behind me. It's great. That's Niall, how are you That's doing? Niall. Great. How Bring about, it on. How about if I walk just another 24 fun. left. What are you going to be beside? 24? You're going there in a minute when 25. you win. Oh, 25. <laughs> so every four miles we had to sit down and change the batteries, which is obviously the suit isn't designed to do marathons. You know, I was in agony. Uh, my back was hurting. And, Hi everybody, we have just reached the five mile mark. We're under time, we're beating a score so far of 20 minutes quicker than we anticipated. So me and my team, very happy. While I was doing my training, I was training in four layers of jumpers, trousers, because it was like minus two, freezing. The marathon was the hottest day in the marathon history. It's obviously the suit been black as well. That didn't help. And then it got towards the night time, because we walked through the night as well. We then had to then change into joggers, coats and jumpers and obviously through the night and then obviously the next morning it was, it was kind of nice weather again so we had to change again. Hi everybody, we've just reached the nine mile mark! So we come to a bit of a hiccup where the suit malfunctioned and, and sat me down uh, while I was crossing the road. Um, so obviously they managed to get me uh, across safely and then because the roads were closed we then had to get the other suit from the hotel where it was and because the roads were closed it was difficult so we actually sat at the side of the road for five hours. So the frustrating point of it is, we were like two hours, two hours ahead of schedule. Still got like, you know, miles to go, and you know, I was ready to psych myself up. And it was then difficult to try and get the momentum back up to that level of getting the adrenaline going to, to finish the race. So the, the hardest point for me was like the last three miles of the race, because um, it was your brain was then taking over, saying you're not going to be able to do this. You're going to let people down. People who sponsored you, you're going to fail. And it was constantly going through your head, thinking like, well, am I actually going to finish this? And I was walking and walking and walking. I kept asking, how much further, how much further? And they said, one mile. So I was like, you said that an hour ago, you know. Until I got up towards the Buckingham Palace near Pall Mall, and uh, there was so many people there screaming, because I didn't organize the finish line, the Brain Tumor Charity did, because we had to get a license to have our own finish line there, because the original one was taken down. Um, so I didn't know who was going to be there, if the camera crew was going to be there, any photographers, the film crew, anything, or any of my supporters. I didn't know my dad was going to be there, so he surprised me, sort of my sister and my auntie and uncle and stuff, so 
that was just like dying inside, uh, so emotional and knowing that I've beat the demons in my head telling me that, you know, you're not going to finish, you're not going to do it. Crossing that finish line was just, uh, uh, to put it into words, I don't know if I can. It was uh, something that I never thought that I would do because even in able, when I was able-bodied, if you'd have told me I was going to complete a marathon, I'd be like, you're crazy. No way would I do that. And the fact that I've done it in a robotic suit, exoskeleton suit, was uh, mind-blowing. So I picked the Brain Tumor Charity because uh, I have a brain tumor myself, so it's a sentimental charity to raise money for. I raised this under £25,000. So I was contacted by Guinness um, World Records and they said that I had um, broken a title for being the first paralysed man to walk the marathon in the time frame I did. So to think that when I was a child, that eventually I was going to be in the book is mind blowing. Uh, so that to me is like an ultimate dream come true. When I told my boy that I was going to be in the book, he's like, oh, well, we buy that every year and we have it at school and we pass it around. And now he's absolutely buzzing because there will be a flick through and the, his dad's going to be in this book. So yeah, it's like an ultimate dream come true. Smashing the marathon was one thing, but now having this is just, uh, you know, top to my bucket list higher, so it's amazing. If you've got any dreams or ambitions, or you just look at a title and think, oh, I'd love a go at that, don't think that by looking at that title, you're not gonna beat it. Um, you do it because you wanna be able to do it to prove yourself that anything's possible to achieve a dream.